Hi everyone and welcome to the new week. Um, in this week we'll be looking at morphology. So in previous weeks we looked at phonetics and phonology, so basically the sounds we use in language and how they behave. And this week we'll be looking at uh, the different parts of a word and how those can behave. So we're kind of moving on from individual sounds to when we start actually looking at meaning. There are a few different concepts we'll be looking at here. Um, so the concepts are on this screen there, morpheme, word, affix, compound, etc. cetera. Um, so we'll look at these in a few different videos, but uh, basically these are all um, gonna be probably the main concepts of the unit. So if you know what these things are by the end, you'll be in pretty good shape. Morphology itself, um, before we get into the other little um, concepts is basically the study of how morphemes combine to form new words. So you might be wondering what is a morpheme? And a morpheme is basically the smallest part of a word that has meaning. So if we can't really break anything down into a smaller part that has meaning, then that is a morpheme. So for example, we have the word unbelievable right here. We can break this into a few different parts. We have believe, we have able that we can attach to believe, we have un that we can attach to unbelievable. So basically we have the root word and then we have able, which means, which tells us that the root word is able, so able to be believed. And then we have un, which tells us that not able to be believed. So each of these parts, believe and able and un, is what's called a morpheme. Basically, each of these parts is telling us something about what the word means. Believe is telling us the main part of it. Able is telling us kind of a modification of believe that this thing is able to be believed. And then un is telling us that this whole thing is negative, so not able to be believed. So each of these parts is a morpheme because it's telling us something about the meaning of the word. There is a bit of cross-linguistic variation uh, in, how, um, in how these languages and how the world's languages will treat morphemes. Um, some languages will have a lot of morphemes in one word. Other languages might have one morpheme per word only. So for example here, we have this language Engeni, where what they say that's translated into let's go look for the house is basically their word for one, their word for go, their word for two, the word for seek, and the word for house. So they have basically one bit of meaning per word or one morpheme per word. So we can't really um, break that up into, uh, into smaller bits of meaning. It's already broken up as small as it can go. Mohawk, on the other hand, can put a whole lot of meaning into one word. In fact, the same sentence in Mohawk, let's go look for the house, is this one big long word, where they have the morpheme meaning you and I, the morpheme meaning two, the one for house, the one for seek, the one for go and. So basically they have a whole lot of different uh, morphemes in one word, so a whole lot of meaning crammed into one word, as opposed to Engeni, where we just had one bit of meaning per word. So another uh, thing to kind of think about is um, what a word is really. So um, in English, because we all speak English, it's going to be relatively easy to decide what exactly a word is. Basically the best way to decide a word is through what's called native speaker intuition. So as native speakers of English, we all kind of know what a word is in English. Um, we can't necessarily know the same thing for other languages if we don't know those. But one thing to kind of think about for words is that words can be pronounced alone, but sometimes individual morphemes can't. So we might have in English, for example, the word dog and then 
if we're talking about more than one dog, we say dogs. So that z or the s on the end is a morpheme because it's telling us that we have more than one dog, but we can't really pronounce that on its own and have it make sense as we can with the root word dog. So dog can be a word, but the s of dogs isn't a word. We also have pauses between words, but not really pauses between morphemes. And then one other thing, or another way to put this same thing, is that words are not usually uh, going to be produced morpheme by morpheme as we talk. We will say morphemes fluently, so to speak. So we're not going to say dog, pause, s. We will say dogs. And... Okay, so <clears throat> one way to kind of look at what is a word, um, and one way that might help a little bit, is looking at it in other languages, because we already have a good sense of what's a word in English. But if we're looking at what's a word in other languages, um, one way to kind of look at this is to see when there is a pause in between bits of meaning. So, for example, we have this sentence, or this phrase, I guess, meaning now then they say. So we have the word here for now, onen, and then there's kind of a pause, and then we have the word for in fact, and then the pause, and then the word for one says. So basically we have now, and then in fact, or then, and then they say. So in Mohawk, since there's pauses between these these bits of meaning, we can kind of tell that they are different words. Then in uh, the same sense, we have these big long words in the same language, Mohawk, where there is no pause between, for example, the uh, ni, the e, the a. Uh, they're all connected into one word. So basically these little dashes mean that we would say this without a pause in between. So in Mohawk, uh, they can have either shorter words or longer words. And this is an example of some longer words. But basically, if there's no pause in between what you're saying, then it's an indication that it might be a word. So we have this uh, couple of big long words for um, they race or they run off into the forest, um, something along those lines. And again, you can have a couple of big long words that mean something like um, they went to pick fruit or to go pick apples. So you can have um, several bits of meaning in one word in Mohawk. Um, so in addition to using that type of pausing um, criteria to look at what a word is, another way to look at what a word is is that in some languages, there's actually a pattern of what syllables are stressed in a word. So if you pay attention to that, then you can also tell what's a word that way. For example, in Finnish, they have the word for donkey, asi, and the word for butterfly, perhonen, and the word for distance, valematka, where each of those first syllables is stressed because in Finnish, the stress is always on the first syllable of a word. So in Finnish, if you hear stress, you can tell where a word is going to begin. We also have something like this <clears throat> in Spanish and in Mohawk, but in Spanish, uh, the primary stress of a word is usually going to be on the second to last syllable. So again, if you hear stress in Spanish, you can <clears throat> have a pretty good idea of where the word boundaries are going to be. So <clears throat> that's kind of how we look at what a word is. There's a few different ways you can do it, um, but once you know what a word is, you can kind of start looking at what the different parts of the word are, which is what we're going to do in these next couple of units. So if you have any questions about um, how to look at what a word is, um, make sure to ask them. 
And if, um, you know, if you're having any trouble with that, uh, just, uh, hopefully, <clears throat> um, the lecture will help. And, um, yeah, so we'll just be looking at the different parts of words in the next couple of lectures.